Into the top 100 and number 100 is probably the most annoying song of all time, Tequila by The Champs. Contrary to popular rumour, Glen Campbell did not play on this recording. In the early years of the 1950s, the hottest ticket in town was Johnny Ray, the Prince of Wales, so called for his hysterically emotional approach to vocals. Cry was his only number one, but over the next five years he had his six additional top tenors. Number 98 is Whatchamacallit by Esquivel. You tell me, I don't have a clue. Crazy and possibly offensive fun these days. From the four lads with 1953's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. The first group inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Coasters, bring their hilarious number 36 hit Run Red Run in at number 96. One of the guys playing rock and roll in the years leading up to the big breakout of 1955 was pianist Moon Mulligan. His swingin' 1956 hit, Seven Nights to Rock, is no doubt his most famous and best. At 94 we have one of the hottest slabs of rockabilly out of Sun Records with Gene Simmons's peroxide blonde and a hopped up muddle Ford. It is real, real gone, daddy-o. It's Tom Lehrer busting some dope rhymes back with his jaunty ode to Annihilation. We will all go together when we go. From 1954, we have everyone's favourite calypso, Jumbi Jamboree. The charmer who performs it grew up to be no less or no more than Louis Farrakhan. Number 91 is a record which attracts a lot of attention as a candidate for the first ever rock and roll record, which is a little unfair as it's a great disc with or without the notoriety. Jackie Brenston's Rocket 88. Jackie Brenston was a saxophonist in Ike Turner's group who got subbed in on vocals and the unique distorted sound is due to a guitar amp that got bounced around and wet on the road to Memphis. This was recorded at Sun Studios and leased to Chess. As it happened, Turner didn't even play guitar on this, sitting in on the piano while Willie Kizart played the fuzzed out guitar. It's more rock and roll time with Little Richard's theme to the music, The Girl Can't Help It, showing off the power and precision of his band. And back to New Orleans for number 89 and Louis Prima's delirious Buona Sera. By 1953, Atlantic was developing a style at the forefront of R&B, with Ruth Brown, Ray Charles, Joe Turner and the Clovers. Written by the same man who wrote Shake, Rattle and Roll, Jesse Stone, your Cash Ain't Nothing But Trash is a wild and funny ride with the Clovers, whose career bought them 18 R&B top 10s and, and two pop top 40s, most notably the original Love Potion number no. 9. The first ever number one on an Australian top 40 chart, The Purple People Eater by Sheb Woolley, makes a list because it's great and everyone loves it. Number 86 is That Man Fats again with Be My Guest, I adore Fats, have I mentioned that before? This song was Tommy Boyce's first songwriting hit. He later teamed up with Bobby Hart to write Hits Are Plenty for the Monkeys. Up next, the great Johnny Otis with Willie and the Hand Giant. If there was a number 201, it would have been his crazy country hop. A great talent scout, musician, and all-round fixer for the music scene, Otis played drums on Big Mama Thornton's original Hound Dog. Jimmy Reed's ominous take out some insurance, a staple of bedroom guitarists worldwide, skulks in at number 84. And an artist discovered by Johnny Otis, the immortal Jackie Wilson, showboats his way through Reet Petit, showing every single singing style and technique imaginable in 2 minutes and 40 seconds. At 82 is an artist I've only recently discovered, so I'm not sure his rank isn't overstated by the shock of the new, but Oliver Nelson provides challenging but groove-laden music on the edge of hard bop. He died appallingly young at 43 from a heart attack, some say was due to overwork. The Stanley Brothers were tremendously influential folk and bluegrass singers in the 1960s, especially on Bob Dylan, who at least had the decency to cover 1958's Rank Stranger to Me, instead of just stealing great chunks of the music the way he usually does. At the Big 8-0, it's the Pilgrim Travelers with the fantastically titled Jesus Hits Like the Atom Bomb. 
Another of my peccadillos are early 50s songs about the bomb, etc., as well as songs about Hadakol. I got me a mess of peccadillos, I tell you. Julie London's Cry Me a River from 1955 is a late night standard that even to this day holds tight its velvet grip on the listener. Laverne Baker is up next with one of the jewels in Atlantic's crown, the relentlessly rocking Jim Dandy from 1956. I defy you not to smile as you listen to this. If you the Mighty Leuven Brothers have number 77 with Cash on the Barrel Head, a record from 1956 that sounds like it could have been recorded 10 years later. They were country rock before rock was even a thing. Back to Memphis, back to 706 Union Avenue and back to Sun Records for number 76 where Johnny Cash recorded Big River as the B-side to his big hit, Ballad of a Teenage Queen. Great record, a slightly bigger sound than the razor thin boom chicka boom sound that Cash usually carried off at Sun. One of my favourite pop albums is Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong's first collab. Keep an eye out for a review. Backed by Oscar Peterson's group, these two laugh and wink their way through some of the great American standards. We barely set foot out of Sun Studios and we're back for another B-side, Carl Perkins's superb Dixie Fried. A masterclass in rockabilly guitar, the story this tells is interesting enough to get even the attention of someone who rarely listens to lyrics, like me. At number 73, I'm smiling already because it's my man Fats Domino with I'm Walking. Fats has the third most entries of any artist on the countdown. Who do you think has more? The sultry diner Washington who could out even Julie London weighs in with what a difference a day makes at 72. The string arrangement on this is perfect beyond perfect. Fair and Young blows the roof off the honky tonk with If You Ain't Lovin' You Ain't Livin'. Clearly modelling his approach on Hank Williams, Young grew to be one of the most distinctive and reliable vocalists in country music in the 1960s. No one's had more country hits over a longer time than George Jones. And of them all, 1958's Life to Go might just be the most heartbreaking. Channeling Lefty Frizzell, Jones's masterful vocal paints a picture of utter human desolation. Speaking of Lefty Frizzell, his step away from the classic honky-tonk, The Long Black Veil, is more like a dabble in the Nashville style and was his last top 40 hit for four years. If Lefty had survived his demons like George Jones did, he would surely have been a leading light of the honky-tonk resurgence in the 1980s. The doomed prince of rockabilly, Gene Vincent, achieved immortality with Bee Boppa Lula in 1956. But the real star here is Blue Cap in Chief, guitarist Cliff Gallup, who stands shoulder to shoulder with the titans of rockabilly guitar. At number 67 is Gene Vincent's great friend, Eddie Cochran, with 20 Flight Rock, a song from the movie The Girl Can't Help It. Unlike Vincent, Cochran didn't have the luxury of lingering to 36. He was dead at 21 in an English car wreck that almost killed Vincent as well. Staying in England and staying in cars, 66 is Vince Taylor's brand new Cadillac, perhaps the best pre-Beatles British rocker. Covered by The Clash, eulogised by Van Morrison and allegedly the model for Ziggy Stardust, Taylor suffered from genuine psychological problems and his massive intake of LSD didn't help. At 65, we have one of the most iconic songs of the 1950s, backed by one of the most iconic album covers, Come Fly With Me by Frank Sinatra, Frank Giddy's most insouciant, cocky and globe bestriding. Essential stuff. Huey Smith and the Clowns, New Orleans R&B par excellence, with the rockin' pneumonia and the boogie-woogie flu, chime in at number 64. Smith had a handful of hits that were turned into a medley by Dr. John on his 1972 mega album Gumbo. Chuck Berry blasts into the stratosphere with Roll Over Beethoven from 1956. This is the music of pure freedom, wild, thrilling, driving, unstoppable. New Orleans again? What is it with this magical city? Smiley Lewis with Shame, Shame, Shame gets more rockin' done in less than two minutes than just about anyone ever, all wrapped up in a funky Rampart Street bow. Ray Price was a legendary hitmaker and the king of the honky-tonks in his day. Heartaches by the number, we'll show you why. Sam Cooke, for all his greatness as a singer, 
only had three top 10 hits in his lifetime and one thereafter. He did have three that reached number 11 though. You Send Me is the perfect summation of his skills post-gospel and a hint of where he was to take them. Into the Darkness with the other great vocalist of the 50s, Patsy Cline, who went walking after midnight and moved country music a giant stride closer towards pop in 1957. This sent what had been a steady career into overdrive and a major talent of the late 50s and early 60s was announced. More rockabilly insanity at number 58 as Gene Vincent and his blue caps go racing with the devil. Bo Diddley's bizarre and bravura performance of Who Do You Love is next, throwing up tropes and images like its rarer blues song does. Oh, it's breathtaking stuff. At 56, we have John Coltrane with his delicious earworm Spiral from the Giant Steps album, a song that once you get into, you can't ever quite get back out of. Buddy Holly cut That'll Be The Day for Decker in Nashville as a Gene Vincent type rockabilly and it didn't work out. But oh boy did the version he re-recorded in Clovis, New Mexico with Norman Petty. A rock and roll standard, a classic, it launched a barely 18 month career where Holly carved himself a legend as big as anyone in rock and roll. The 1950 version of Billy's Bounce is up next by Charlie Parker's Great Quintet. The bum note at 16 seconds is Miles Davis, which is okay. In bebop, one man's clam is another man's augmented fifth. 53, we're back in the big easy for Lloyd Price's seminal Lordy Miss Claudy from 1952. That's Fats Domino playing the piano, as if that needed any clarification. Fats is a line you can tell by the claw. 1951 and the master of the slide guitar, Elmore James, struck like a thunderbolt with his signature song, Dust My Broom. It was Elmore James more than anyone who first got me into listening to the blues. Chet Baker blows in at number 51 with Let's Get Lost, his dreamy voice and mellow trumpet painting a pop classic. Such a shame his life descended into a heroin horror show and it ended when he fell out of a window onto an Amsterdam street in 1988. At number 50, it's the last appearance of Fats Domino with I'm Ready, in which he advises, don't send me no letter because I can't read. Of course he could. So long, Fats. It's been fun. Frank Sinatra brings Why Try to Change Me Now from his masterpiece No One Cares album. A reviewer on another channel recently said emo Barbie doll Lana Del Rey had better phrasing than Sinatra. He's entitled to his opinion, of course, but he's wrong. We finish with Fats, but not New Orleans, as Frankie Ford's vivacious sea cruise sets sail at number 48. Ford had a handful of minor hits. This, in making number 14, was his biggest. He's not the strongest singer, but the arrangement is great, and he gives it 100%. The man they call the killer, and without doubt the oldest living man on this list, Mr. Jerry Lee Lewis, comes in at number 47 with his version of Big Maybell's whole lot of shaking going on. Forget the scandal, forget the downfall, forget the long, long trail of ex and deceased wives. Just bear this in mind. Elvis Presley once said if he could sing like Jerry Lee Lewis, he'd die a happy man. Full-time weirdo and jazz composer extraordinaire Sun Ra pops up at 46 with India. It's not free jazz, but it is fascinatingly abstract in every facet of it. Get in and dig the vibes. Webb Pierce's Backstreet Affair is not only a great record, hence its placement at 45, but an important one, being the first direct discussion of sexual infidelity in country music. Thus, in 1952, was born the true cheating song. The Spirit of Memphis Quartet provides some delightfully dippy gospel at 44 with the atomic telephone. Don't ask, just listen. Chuck Berry next with his dryly witty too much monkey business. Chuck will beat the world if only he would get off his back for a minute. And I love the guitar solo on this too. Manteca, which I believe is Spanish for butter, which also was Dizzy Gillespie's codename for pot, and his 1956 celebration of this is infectious. Afro-Cuban charged and indispensable for any lover of 50s jazz or anyone who wants to get hooked on 50s jazz. 
Muddy Waters hangs out just outside the top 40 with his blues band Standard, Got My Mojo Workin', a motor and blues number that fuses industrial rituals of Chicago with the ancient language and culture of the Delta. At number 40, Billy Ward and the Dominoes indulge in some wild braggadocio about just how well their mojo works in 60 Minute Man, another of those bridge records between R&B and rock and roll. The only song which I believe exists in two versions on the countdown is Shake, Rattle and Roll, captured here with its dirty lyrics by Big Joe Turner. Joe Turner and Bill Haley were great friends and frequently toured together. Often they would swap versions, Joe singing Bill's clean lyrics and Bill singing Joe's dirty ones. Monin, Art Blakey's call and response workout that remains one of the most imitated and influential pieces in jazz holds down number 38. Blakey's drumming here is exceptional, but the whole piece demands the listener's attention and at an almost visceral level of engagement from go to woe. Little Walter takes front and centre of the Muddy Waters band for Duke, one of the best known and beloved of blues instrumentals, showing all the dexterity on harmonica of the master tenorman of the day. Our last visit from Johnny Mathis as he takes Errol Garner's Misty for a timeless walk down the path of vocal mastery. Like all his contributions here, this is ludicrously silky and seemingly effortless. Miles Davis put together a red-hot sextet in 1958, adding Cannonball Latterly to his first great quintet, as much for personal reasons as musical, and forging an aggressive, swinging, hard bop sound that added modalism to the music for the first time. The Milestones album is remarkable, and this, the title track, is one of the most exciting pieces in all of jazz. Eddie Cochran is back with his song to the grand design of life, Summertime Blues, surely one of the best known of all classic rock and roll songs. Dave Brubeck's Time Out album from 1959 is full of little musical puzzles and jokes for those dry theoreticians or engaging clever grooves for those of us who just want to dig the band. And this is especially evident on the twisty and irresistible blue rondo a la Turk. Back in New Orleans for the third to last time with a song recorded there by Ray Charles, no less. I Got a Woman, one of the most explicit yet gatherings of gospel music into the R&B stream. It had probably happened before this, but the records that did it just weren't as good as this one, and they didn't get noticed. Great a songwriter as Hank Williams was, he didn't always write his own hits. In fact, he didn't even write his biggest record, Love Sick Blues, but he sure sang them like he wrote them. Such was the case with Fred Rose's Take These Chains From My Heart, which was also a hit for Ray Charles. Its themes of despair and helplessness tying in well with Williams' established persona and the circumstances of his life at the time. Charlie Parker's Now's The Time has been a solid favourite of mine since the early 80s. A fierce, hard riffing straight blow without much bebop tomfoolery. This is the 1955 version without Miles Davis's unconvincing trumpet part. Johnny Cash's classic Folsom Prison Blues is next at 29. It's a bit of a rip taking a bunch from Gordon Jenkins' Crescent City Blues. It's also the first song I learned to play on guitar, so there you have it. Still, anyone who's willing to shoot a man in Reno just to watch him die is welcome to a post in the top 30, so I think. Professor Longhair's all-time classic Tipitina, which wrote, signed, and froze off the book on New Orleans piano, comes in at the 27. It's from this point on that my shortlist to find the number one record began. The second mark of Sonny Boy Williamson brings his nasty Don't Start Me to Talkin', led by his buzzing, bending harmonica. Why are there two Sonny Boy Williamsons, did you ask? Don't start me to talkin', I'll tell you everything I know. It's Hank Williams with the wonderful Hey Good Lookin' Up next. What with hot rods, sody pop and all that going steady, one might even think that Hank was going rockabilly or combine that with the film of him performing it on the Kate Smith show on TV in 1952 with him doing a hip swivel and shimmy, you'd be further convinced. Also, it's rare, one of only about three songs that Hank did with a piano on it and it's the plinky plonky piano that keeps this rooted squarely in country. Elmore James is back with his often covered The Sky is Crying, written during, oddly enough, a torrential thunderstorm in Chicago one afternoon. The man they call the Prez, Lester Young, was the anti-Charlie Parker. His solos never overthought, always easy and breathy, and relying on simplicity, feel, and that thin, dry sound. His I Can't Get Started record with Oscar Peterson and co. is a thing of timeless beauty. Back 
shortly for the last time to New Orleans and that record that to a lot of people's minds defines rock and roll. Tutti Frutti by Little Richard. Cut at JM Studios, a 16x15 box on North Rampart Street with Cosimo Matassa and Bumps Blackwell, this song is a masterpiece of force, economy and exuberance. In 2007, Mojo Magazine voted this song number one in their top 100 records that changed the world. The perennial naughty schoolboy of the blues, Johnny Guitar Watson, declared himself the gangster of love in 1957 and edged the blues a little closer to rock and roll with this ode to, well, himself. Top 20 time, and it's that singer who is the perfect example of why it is better to have a great technique and a passable voice than the other way around. Peggy Lee with the richly evocative black coffee. The Soul Stirrers, with their timeless second tenor of Sam Cooke, lays down some fiery jubilee singing on I'm Gonna Build On That Shore, the greatest gospel record of the 1950s. John Coltrane is back with one of those songs that, if you play jazz, is apparently a rite of passage which few pass, Giant Steps. Yet it is so relaxing and warm sounding to listen to, and you just know what Train is trying to say in it. Now we come to one of the most important records in the history of Western music. If you had to name straight off the top of your head a song by Elvis Presley, what would it be? For me, it would be Heartbreak Hotel. Oddly, no one I asked this to in person said that. It's not Elvis's greatest record, but it is his most important and significant because it allied to television, gave rock and roll and youth culture as a whole, the spearhead it needed to cross the country and the ocean and take over the direction of popular music. Oddly, next we have one of the most adult records ever made. As Frank Sinatra shows us what it is to have lived, loved, lost and longed for with angel eyes from his wonderful Only the Lonely album. Chuck Berry paints his ultimate 50s aspirational fantasy with Johnny B. Good, the hardest, grooviest, most out there of his tall tales and the one hero of his we can unreservably and uncritically cheer for. Go Johnny, go. Of all the how is this isn't number ones here, the most mysterious to me is Billie Holiday's I'm a Fool to Want You. In TRB7, I rhapsodized over what this song meant to me. Holiday's last great hurrah, but also her shining hour of triumph. A masterclass in what the human voice is truly capable of communicating. Barrett Strong's Money, released in 1959, heralded the arrival of a force from the north. Tamla Records, who as Tamla Motown, would one day boast a catalogue to rival Atlantic's. One of the key stepping stones from R&B to soul, Strong was later to earn more fame as a songwriter, co-penning I Heard It Through the Grapevine, along with many others. B.B. King announced himself in 1951 with Three O'Clock Blues, a number one R&B hit that helped legitimise the new electric blues form. King was to go on to classic after classic for the 20 years following that. Number 11 is Nina Simone's remarkable, extemporised rendition of I Love You Porgy. Captured after a session wrapped up as she was passing time at the piano, an engineer having the foresight to capture it. For sheer power and naked emotion, few recordings can stand with this one. Top 10 time and holding down the position indicated by the highest pyramid number in the sequence, it is Hank Williams' saddest and greatest, in my opinion, song, You Win Again. I have a whole presentation on this song coming out shortly, but suffice to say, it's songs like this which explain why classic country music was what it was. Number 9, Rock and Roll's craziest, most chaotic and definitive 115 seconds, Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis. If this doesn't get your party started, I don't know what will. Who says jazz has to be long, expansive, exploratory? In 2 minutes 58 seconds, Thelonious Monk's Straight No Chaser shows the author's true genius, the ability to harness complex musical modes and make them into song formats we can all enjoy. Miles Davis's Porgy and Bess is my favourite album of all time, and its centrepiece is My Man Is Gone Now, a beauty beyond rubies where Miles' low register becomes its own language. Number six, and there's still one more trick in the box for Elvis. Some would argue the moment when he becomes the Elvis we know and loved. His take on Junior Parker's Mystery Train, his final record at Sun. His voice has finally mellowed and settled into that velvet rumble that dominated his pre-army days. 
Five is Muddy Waters, who built a roadmap for the future of the classic canon when he went into Chess Studios in February 1950 and simply played at his stage volume, which was louder than anyone had ever played in a recording studio before. The fuzzed out, blary sound gave the blues a distant sense of power and menace it never lost and later fused into rock and heavy metal music. It says I never mentioned heavy metal. Four might just be the best solo Miles Davis ever blew on So What from 1959's Kind of Blue. Ably supported by Paul Chambers, Bill Evans and Jimmy Cobb's impeccable groove, Davis is a font of ideas which he takes patiently and in beautiful voice and then Messrs Adderley and Coltrane come along and do their very best as well. Three might just be the least well known to the average fan's selection in the top 100. Dimuendo and Crescendo in Blue by Duke Ellington. Obscure perhaps, but anyone even half serious about music needs to hear Paul Goncalves' 27 verse sax solo at least once in their lifetime and feel the thrill. Number two is the funkiest, fiercest thing the 50s ever threw at us brother Ray Charles and his electric, testifying, scarifying, monumental, what did I say? Deserves to be number one. In some versions of this video it is. Number one. One for my baby by Frank Sinatra. As much as Heartbreak Hotel or So What or Rolling Stone or The Purple People Eater or a Hank Williams Honky Tonker could be said to define aspects of the 50s from a cultural or musical or personal philosophical perspective, it is still best embodied in the knockabout optimism, the fierce expression to enjoy your own life on your own terms and carry your own crosses. That last era of the man's man's man by Frank Sinatra. His joys were those we aspired to, his crushing losses, those we stood back and watched him work through. Here in Deep Nights with Ava Gone, he summoned up his unsurpassed art as barstool philosophy and taught us how to carry those courses, how hate had its place and forgiveness its, and how we could once again swing ourselves upwards. It's like they say, it really was Frank Sinatra's world and he just let us live in it.